Good evening everyone Welcome to our evening Dhamma talk First I'd like to just Mention something that uh, That came up today I was talking with one of my Online meditators And they mentioned that uh, They had been showing a friend of theirs how to meditate A friend or maybe it was a A relative I'd just like to say how great that is How great it is to uh, to hear and to make clear that uh, Sharing meditation teachings with others is Is okay, it's good It's not something to be afraid of Um, I think one of the reasons uh, one of the reasons people don't is simply um, uh, this sort of misunderstanding that you need to be at, uh, on some high teacher level to to be able to explain meditation practice to others and. Well, that certainly might be true for leading someone through a intensive course in meditation. There's, there's nothing complicated about basic meditation teachings. It's a great thing to share. Not that you should go out and try and convert people to meditation, but if someone asks you about it, you shouldn't be afraid to... You shouldn't brush them off by saying, I'm sorry, I'm not qualified. So yesterday we were talking about, I was talking again about this uh, idea of how meditation is useful in the world. So I wanted to continue on in the same vein and, and talk about What good meditation is for our spiritual journey in the universe you know, Sort of just flesh it out I guess just talk a little bit about the spiritual journey <laughs> To help give a bit of a road map Or a bit of a Lesson in Buddhist cosmology, I suppose Although cosmology doesn't really Describe the Buddhist conception of the universe Cosmology is sort of It implies space as the defining base But space isn't the defining base in Buddhism In Buddhism the defining base is uh, experience Which means that when we talk about realms of existence Bhumi Well it's true, we're, we're generally talking about spaces These spaces overlap And these spaces are Are, are, are actually more mental than they are physical Not that they don't have a physical component Most of them But When we talk about spaces or realms We're, 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 we're not speaking in terms of Literally physical realms And so we have all these realms That we talk about The, ob the obvious ones are the 
realms of animals and the realms of human humans or the realm one realm for animals one realm for humans and just by those two you can see that it's somewhat of an artificial uh, distinction I guess a lot of people argue that animals are humans and, or humans are animals sorry. and moreover it's pretty clear that we inhabit the same realm right, physically speaking and so it gives you a sense of what we mean by realm it's a, it's a different category of existence and the less obvious ones, we have the ghost realm that we've most cultures talk about. We have the angel realm that many cultures talk about. We have the god realm that again many cultures talk about. We have the hell realm that many cultures talk about. So we have these various, these these different realms, different types of existence. And, I mean, to some extent it behooves us to learn about these realms, to understand them, and to... to become aware of, of what leads one to be born in any one of these realms. To understand how the universe works. I think the simple existence of these realms is helped by you know, a appreciation or a, um, an open-mindedness at least to the potential for the ex their existence even though we can't uh, perceive most of these realms on an ordinary level it's helped by by looking at the world from the point of view of, of, of experience as a meditator I mean, from from a point of view of the physical universe, it's hard to believe that there are angels out there because you can't see them, you can't find them, no matter how hard you look. Even if you use all sorts of specialized equipment, you can't really find, you can't see them. And yet that doesn't give a... Um, it doesn't give evidence or conclusion that that they don't exist. I mean, there's no reason to think that things outside of our ordinary experience can't exist, things that can't be perceived through ordinary instruments. But it does make it somewhat suspicious. Why can't we perceive them? Or it calls into question their existence. Why should we believe that they exist? So from that point of view, from the physical point of view, it, it's it's quite uh, quite difficult to conceive that these other realms might exist. But from a point of view of experience, it doesn't pose any sort of difficulty when you meditate you realize that from a simple point of experience anything's possible so many different types of experiences are possible you get hints of this when you see how your mind is changing your body we think of this as just um, the mind interacting with the body but it's actually sort of understood more as the mind changing the body in the sense 
of not changing a body as an entity, but changing bodily experiences. So for example, tension. Meditators will come into the practice with a lot of physical tension. And uh, their whole posture and their facial, facial structure, facial features, their s digestive systems, their respiratory systems, their circulatory systems will uh, they'll be they'll be working in a specific way uh, that changes through the meditation as the meditator relaxes their facial features will change you know slightly we're talking about they'll look like they'll, they'll look calmer more peaceful not that suddenly they'll their eyes will change color or something But their digestive system will, will work generally better. Their the blood, the circulatory system of of whatever you call that uh, will flow better, more freely. The respiratory system may work better, this kind of thing, as they relax and the body works, begins the systems work in different ways, in new ways. They'll become more flexible, they'll be free from from some of the pain that they might otherwise experience. So you start to see how malleable, at least on a on a minor level, how malleable the body is. You see how malleable the brain can be in terms of retraining habits. You see how intractable it can be in terms of how stubborn it can be at maintaining old habits. But how you see how change can come about. And moreover, you start to see experiences as not connected in, 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 or as entities. So the mind is not a soul or a self. You start to see that experiences are, are not connected. And there really is no entity that we can call the body or the mind. Certainly not the self. As a result, you see experience as strange and sometimes wonderful experiences can come about. Blissful experiences, excruciatingly painful experiences. You can have experiences that make you feel like you are one with God or even that you are a God. You can have experiences that make you feel like you're in hell. And everything in between. Strange experiences, voices talking to you, seeing pictures, seeing images that you've never seen before. Sometimes you'll have rapture, you'll feel like you're floating. Sometimes it will feel like your body is growing large. Sometimes it will feel like your body has disappeared. You'll see bright lights. You'll feel extreme bliss and peace, or, or conversely, you'll feel great anger, anxiety, and depression, and so on. I mean, all that should clear up as you practice, but it can come. There's many different experiences. And so it's true that we're stuck, for the most part, in a, 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 a specific set of experiences. But it's not a complete hold, and it's not a hardwired, or it's not it's not intrinsic. You know, these experiences that we have that make us see this world as a static entity, this universe as the static entity we we describe it as, or modern science describes it. It's not to say there isn't more. You start to see that there's a, there's a potential, and so it's not really that difficult to imagine some change based on the habits that we cultivate. That the direction that we're going will continue when we die. That death is actually 
much more physical process. It describes the breakdown of a physical system. Doesn't ha doesn't actually describe what happens in terms of our experience, though we tend to conjecture that experience ceases. There's no reason to think that experience ceases. It's not a very good reason anyway. Anyway, believe it or not, we're assuming that there's open-mindedness here and I'm assuming in giving this talk that people are open to the idea. I just want to explain how we understand it. But more importantly, to talk about where are we going? How do we know where we're going? And so Buddhism talks about the defining factors of of our spiritual journey the negative ones the positive ones and then three negative ones are greed anger and delusion these are the three roots of unwholesomeness and they are the root of all evil and we call it evil because it leads to evil it leads to stress and suffering it leads to the unpleasant realms the realms of loss, the realms of suffering. So a person with a lot of greed is said to be on their way to the realm of the hungry ghosts. Ghosts are seen or described as beings who are always in a constant state of want, never getting enough. It reflects the cultivation of greed, where you never have enough. So once this body, this physical realm, dissolves, you're left with the wanting, and that conditions the next realm or the next creation. And if it's intense greed, it will be a, in a state of great want, so you hear these ghost stories that echo this, the ghosts who are clinging to something in life and, and are unable to be satisfied, always cold, always hungry, maybe guarding a particular spot based on something that they were very much attached to, a house, people, treasure, right? hear stories like this. And if a person has a lot of anger, well, this is what is said to lead one to hell. A person who is full of anger is on the way to hell, and you can see this in people who are alive, right? A person full of anger, well, it looks like they're coming straight out of hell already. But like breeds like. A person full of anger is only to be pitied. Because their journey is headed in that direction. There's nothing mysterious about why this happens, you see. You can believe that it happens or disbelieve that it happens. But if there is an afterlife, angry people, there's, there's no reason to think they would go anywhere but a hellish, angry, awful realm. Hell is a terrible place. You know, you give the simile of the Buddha, right? The Buddha gave this simile because they asked him, you know, can you describe hell? Is, is, what, what's hell like? Right? We said, oh, it's not easy. Not easy to describe hell. And they said, well, can you try? And the Buddha said, well, imagine there were a man who who was sentenced to death by the king and the king ordered his executioners to stab him with a spear a thousand times in the morning take a sharp blade and stab him with it or a point pointy stick let's say right stab him with it a thousand times a thousand times 
And so they do this and they come back to the king and say, well, we did it. Uh, is he dead? Uh, no, he's still alive. Uh, all right, well, stab him another thousand times. And so in the afternoon, they stab him with another thousand, with a spear another thousand times. And they come back and he's still alive. And the king says, well, stab him again. And so in the evening again, they stab him a thousand times, the Buddha says. So this is basically being stabbed by spear constantly. And the Buddha said, well, do you think that would be painful for the guy? And they said, yes, yes, that would be very painful. And the Buddha said, well, that's not that's not uh, a thousandth or a ten thousandth part of the suffering that, that you gain, suffering that you undergo in hell. So much so that, it, as I said, it's difficult to come up with a simile. In hell they tie you down and chop you up with axes or they cut little uh, bite-sized pieces of your flesh out and feed them to you. Or they saw off the top of your head and drop hot uh, molten steel balls, red or hot steel balls in, into your brain. Or they pry open your mouth and pour, mol pour molten lava down. I mean, there's lots of wonderful descriptions of what can go on in hell. Believe it or not, these are the stories. But believe it or not, that's the sort of thing hell is. Hell is an awful, it's all based on anger. So it would take a lot of, a very sort of intense anger to get there, but not so difficult to achieve. And third, if a person has great delusion, well, there's only one one realm left, and that's the animal realm. A person with great delusion is reborn as an animal. Delusion is the sort of, well, arrogance is the type of delusion, conceit, pride, bigotry, racism, <laughs> you know. Look at some of these bigoted individuals, people who are spouting this sort of awful, well, there's a lot of hatred there as well, but the uh, arrogance and conceit and militarism, us and them, fear of what is foreign, that kind of thing. There's a sort of um, a sense that you can get. These people are not high-thinking individuals. They seem somewhat akin to animals, right? Because animals are like that. Look at a cat or a dog. They can be quite arrogant or, you know, dumb anyway. <laughs> Another one is just sheer stupidity in the sense of not even desiring to better oneself, not having any inclination to understand the world. It's a very dangerous uh, mind state. Ignorance and willful ignorance. Not wanting to consider higher, higher questions of existence and happiness and peace not being inclined to make the world a better place or, or you know, at least live in such a way as you are have a positive impact and and bring about positive change as a matter of course. These are animal qualities, selfishness, ignorance, arrogance, conceit, etc., etc., even doubt. <laughs> doubt is up there. Doubt is a type of delusion. So be careful about your doubt. People who, just because you think a lot doesn't mean you're wise. So people who think a lot, even people who study a lot, read a lot, talk a lot, it's not a good, not, not a sign of wisdom. 
though some I think think it is no philosophers I bet there's been a lot of philosophers who ended up born as animals just because they thought too much yeah, maybe that's going too far there's a lot of good a lot of the famous philosophers are pretty you know interested in good things but some not I would say you know it's easy to get into a philosophy that's caught caught up in delusion and and you know lack of compassion or interest in goodness if you're not interested in goodness very difficult to be born as a human being because well that's the next step how how then do you avoid these these uh, realms and one avoids them at the very minimum by cultivating the sorts of minds and the sorts of of mind state state of mind that is within the realm of the five precepts so the buddha identified the five precepts as sort of a good boundary where you could mark the border between the human realm and the lower realms if someone's of the sort of uh, inclination to keep the five precepts so it's not talking about keeping them actually because that's misleading a person can keep all the five precepts and still go to hell and a person can break all the five precepts and still be reborn in heaven it's more about your inclination especially at the moment when you die although that is very much influenced by by how you've lived your life right it's not to say you can be an evil person and then get off scot-free, though it does on occasion happen, because just at the last moment you suddenly incline yourself in a good way and poof, you set yourself up in heaven, but it wouldn't last long, you know. Because you get angry and anger anger is something anger is one of the causes of death in heaven, apparently. All it takes is for an angel to get very angry and they die. So if you're an evil person who somehow manages to make it, you know, just by the thrust of the goodness at the moment of death, you won't last long. But you have to understand it as a result in this way. Think of the five precepts as sort of a boundary. If you don't keep them and if you're not inclined to keep them, mm, not so likely to be born as a human being. On the other hand, if you're inclined to keep the five precepts you appreciate them and they define who you are as a person then congratulations you're worthy of being a human and so this is most people right or the majority of people the majority of us you know we break the five precepts from time to time but we're not inclined to break them as a rule. We understand lying's not so good. Killing, you know, many people nowadays don't kill. Steal, yeah, maybe once in a while, but we're not inclined to it, and we understand it's not nice. To be born a human, you have to have this sort of sense. This is why we sometimes spe uh, pos speculate that there is an innate sense, an innate sense of morality. I mean, that's just because we've cultivated this uh, that's that's why we were born human animals you can see don't really have this sense a dog might decide not to hurt you because well that, that's uh, not a good thing but they wouldn't think twice to kill a small animal or to bite another dog cats are even worse they're cruel and evil without thought But humans, well, we've, this is how we've got here. We've cultivated for lifetime after lifetime this understanding, this sense of the wrongness. Lucky us. That just makes you a human. It's not, to, it's not something to rest your laurels on. Because there's more. What it takes to be born as an angel, well, an angel requires goodness. 
And these people are more rare they, It's not that they don't exist But to find a person To find a person who is inclined to real goodness right? To find a person who is inclined to meditate at all Certainly not the majority of human beings Most human beings won't make it to heaven That's for sure but there are humans, you'll find them You'll find these people who are inclined to goodness They don't wish harm on other beings, they wish only peace and happiness And so from time to time they might get angry or have their own desires And they'll be arrogant or conceited from time to time But in general, they're not They're patient, they're calm, they're content They're humble they're helpful, they're kind, they're loving, these kind of people. They certainly don't break the five precepts. Such a person is like an angel on earth. And when they die, they're very, very likely to be born in heaven. And so this is meditation comes in very handy here. This isn't just about doing good deeds and saying good things. It's about having a truly pure and generous and gentle and uh, beneficial mind. Which we cultivate through meditation very much. I mean, meditation is about seeing this different. Seeing the road that we're on and, and waking up and realizing the, the, the mistakes uh, The mistaken habits we've been cultivating That have set us on a path towards danger This is one of the one of the results of meditation. You start to feel a change. You start to feel this transformation of energy from stress and tension, from anger and greed and conceit and arrogance and so on, from fear and worry to peace, calm, contentment. Love, kindness, compassion, clarity, wisdom It comes naturally These aren't things you have to build up artificially inside yourself They come from seeing things They come from seeing clearly Because of course as you see clearly You're not inclined to engage in activities that hurt yourself All it takes is to show yourself the difference and you naturally incline away, the Buddha said, like a tree inclining in one direction. You start to pull it and it begins to incline in the other direction. This is how it, how it comes about as you practice. You begin to turn away from habits and you know, behaviors, thoughts, speech. That cause harm to you or harm to others Because they become Becomes clear the stress and suffering involved So as a result You're much more likely as a meditator To be born in heaven I mean, um, Just the fact that you're inclined To meditate is a sign of Some higher thought and The last one is to be born as a god Yes, you can. You too can be God. Right? A God is a bit, maybe a bit of a misleading title. It's God in Buddhism is not all powerful or even all knowing. God is just kind of profound. And you can be born as a profound sort of being that we would call Brahma, God. Having 
And of course, this is attained through the practice of tranquility meditation, through the practice of meditation, deep trance-like states that are profound and deep and, and stable and fixed and all, the, all of the qualities that you might think a god might possess. So this is why Hinduism talks very much about I am God, you are God, because wow, they enter into some godlike states. Pure love, pure tranquility, pure calm, pure equanimity, lots and lots of good states. I think for meditators in, in our tradition, the meditators here in our center, say, oh, that probably sounds good right about now. <laughs> like, Give me some of that, please. But no, because we have one more path for you. Where instead of entering into a profound and calm state, we purposefully keep you in this terrible, nasty, awful state that is shallow and meaningless. The final, the, the last path, of course, the path to Nibbana is, is completely different in quality. It doesn't say anything about any of these directions, right? The Buddha would often describe it as, in a sense, directionless. No coming, no going. And it's easy to think that that's just a poetic statement, but it's not. It's quite profound in this context, because all of these other ones are about going somewhere. Where are you going? And in a sense, Nibbana is about not going anywhere. And, and, and it's not even that. It's about giving up the concept of going, which means not discriminating between states, not inclining towards one or the other. When, when greed, anger, delusion come up, you don't repress them. You don't run away from them. You study them. When pain and suffering come, you don't run away from hell. You learn about it, you study it. And of course, uh, on the way of studying, you'll become less inclined towards those things that cause suffering. There's no question about that. But you'll also become less um, distressed by suffering, less concerned about leaving it behind. And you'll become even less afraid of of defilements because they won't not in the sense of being okay with having them but in the sense of not reacting to them you know for example a, a simple example would be um, cultivating all sorts of good deeds because you're afraid of going to hell for example there's nothing wrong with that it's wholesome but it's limited because it doesn't stop you from getting angry it just kind of suppresses it okay I'm, I don't want to get angry so I'll cultivate all sorts of good things I don't want to be greedy so I'll give all my belongings away it's good, it's, it's positive but it's not enough you see, this is a different kind of path or, or I'll, I'll enter into these trance states that are free from all defilement Right, the five hindrances are suppressed in the trance states the jhanas but it's yet not enough. And so we have another task, a higher task. It's the task of rising above all of this, this whole framework. Understanding it, yes, but understanding that it's in and of itself limited inherently. And there's nowhere you could go, be it heaven or the God realms, Or you can escape suffering. And so you have to break down the system. You have to step outside of the system. And instead of focusing your efforts on going to heaven, which isn't a bad place to go, you focus your efforts on understanding heaven, hell, pain, pleasure, greed, anger, delusion. Understand these things. Study them. come to see that even happiness or suffering is impermanent that 
the system itself is un unstable, it's chaotic. You don't know what's coming next. Any expectations you might have are, are ultimately going to set you up for disappointment when they don't when they aren't fulfilled. And that you can't control this, you can't you can't enter into a state that is going to permanently keep you from that is permanently going to keep you from suffering or from disappointment. Not in this framework. Because this framework is constantly shifting. Changing. So we cultivate insight meditation. We cultivate insight meditation for the purpose of understanding this system. Not even in terms of how I've been describing it, but understanding it as changing, as impermanent suffering and non-self, and, and as limited, as unable to satisfy. And letting go, you enter into Nibbana. Nibbana is not just another realm, although I think it is called a realm, but it's a different, categorically different. There is no arising, there is no ceasing, there is no coming, there is no going. It's beyond this impermanence and stress and hmm, this meaningless realm, this meaningless universe. Not an easy one to attain. Most of us are just happy if we can get into heaven or even as a human. I'll be okay if I'm born as a human again, right? But this is a more noble path. I mean, what is so wonderful about this path is you can see clearly that it's something different. Even going to heaven is a bit of a cheap thrill. It can last millions of years, but in the end, it's only a vacation. Nothing wrong with heaven, except that, except that it's limited. And this is such an honest and and pure and sincere path. And it's unshakable, it's invincible. Because it doesn't matter what, what you experience, be it refined or coarse, on heaven or earth. Through understanding, and through letting go, become invincible. There's nothing that can bring you to suffer. So, there you go. Just a little bit about Buddhist, I don't know if that's what you'd call metaphysics. <laughs> the Buddhist universe, let's call that talk, okay? And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer otherwise. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Simon. I think Simon's my biggest fan. He's the cheering gallery, or the, the cheerleading squad. It's nice to have someone. No, I appreciate it. I also appreciate it, the criticism if those people who tell me what a rotten teacher I am. It's always nice to hear that as well. Lisa. It's good to be of use, good to be helpful. It's good to live our lives in a way that is peaceful and harmonious and beneficial to others, no? All right, a question regarding death. Let's talk about death. It's a good one. One of my, this Grace, Grace Anne, who I often talk to you about, I think, is uh, we had a French exam today. I'm learning French. 
have a French meditator and I've been learning how to speak French to her, one of my online meditators. I've had several, but right now I have one. And, uh, so it's a reason for learning French. And uh, anyway, we were in French class and I was... She said, she turned to me and she, she said, I, don't, I just want to slap you because you're always negative. And it's true, you know, as Buddhists we always focus on the negative. Because she'll want to be all positive and talk about how how uh, you know want to pretend everything's good and fine, but she suffers a lot, so you can't say that that's you know surefire philosophy. I agree being pessimistic's probably not a good one either, but anyway, that talking about death is great. It's great to talk about the bad stuff, right? I think it's great. I think you can be very very much at peace talking about all the bad stuff. Because it means you become comfortable with it. Comfortable in the sense it doesn't scare you anymore. The boogeyman is only a problem when you're afraid of him. Right? Monsters under the bed are only dangerous insofar as you're afraid of them. Okay, you have a question. Did you already ask it and I wasn't listening? Oops, what did I do? Sit down. All right, where are we? I know we shouldn't speculate too much, but, right, but I'm going to speculate. Is that it? But in the case of sleep, dreamless sleep, we have, an, yeah, this is speculative. What are you doing? We have an absence of experience. Why should death be any different? Why should experience continue? Hmm. Death seems like the end of any personal conscious experience. All right, well, there definitely are experiences where we seem not to be experiencing anything. The funny thing about sleep is you are, in, to some extent, aware. And you only know that um, in comparison. Um, there are other states where you're not aware. I mean, the state of, of the realization of Nibbana shows you this difference. Because the realization of Nibbana is, is timeless. So you won't have any sense that time has passed. You won't have any memory of the experience itself because there's nothing to remember. No, there's nothing, you know, it's not subject to memory. Uh, and sleep isn't like that. Sleep, there is a coarse vague nebulous sense of time having passed even though you don't feel it you know we, we don't an ordinary in an ordinary state we we think of it it feels like wow time just disappeared but not in the same way there's still consciousness there's not much memory making or much, much thinking right though there is some when we have dreams but um, throughout there is subtle consciousness we call bhavanga, right? We talk about this bhavanga consciousness, and and you know, there's been a lot of argument about whether that actually exists or whether the Abhidhamma system is just all imaginary. But if you've experienced nibbana, you can there there is a difference. The experience of nibbana is free from bhavanga. There is none of that sort of nebulous sense of having slept. I mean the other the other aspect of that is these interesting cases of near death experiences or or after brain death experiences where people are conscious after they've died, uh, which you know sort of and and people have outer body experiences where they that which they describe as being super lucid in a sense of, you know, being more alert than in, ordi in an ordinary state. Um, you know, these, these, this woman who had this, who had this uh, brain clot, a seizure, and went into this pure state because half of her brain wasn't working.
to beings in the god realms and angel realms continue to meditate until they realize Nibbana. It depends on the individual. Um, the god realms, some of the god realms are not able to meditate. And they're just stuck in a state that doesn't allow them apparently. And this is again, believe it or not, it might. it's just what the texts say. Um, but they're they're too much stuck in a trance to be able to meditate. But uh, then there's the Sudavasas, the, the Anagami realms, and they obviously meditate because they become an ara they become arahants from there. Anagamis have their own special realms. There are five Anagami realms, and certainly angels meditate, can meditate. Don't always, don't always. But Saka meditated, Subrahma Deva Buddha meditated, lots of angels who came to see the Buddha meditated. You have, uh, if you know the Dhamma Chakapavattana Sutta, the Buddha's first discourse, you have, uh, you know, we have all the angels listening, but uh, in, on the statue, I was just reminded recently that there are two angels on this carved ancient statue to remind us that the angels were listening as well. And so many angels actually did practice the Buddha's teaching. So it's not even just continue, but angels who never heard of the Buddha or Buddhism might come, to, might have, or did come down. Even today, might come to a meditation center and listen to Dhamma talks and learn how to practice meditation. Or they're probably w practicing together up in heaven because there's lots of Sotapanas and Sakatakamis up in heaven. Note, I say up, but I use that in a colloquial Western sen Western you know, idiomatic usage. It's not actually up. Exactly. Although maybe it is. Maybe you could consider like the space that we see. What we see as space is actually in another frame. It's actually the angel realms, something like that. Are you reading the Mahasi Sayada book or just the Sutta itself? I guess I should go have a look. Okay, anyway, I'm going to head home. So thank you all for coming tonight. Oh, we got quite a crowd. Looks like someone doesn't have their voice, so they're probably just... Looks like someone is actually just sitting there. Does this person have voice? Yeah, we've got someone without voice who probably wonders what we're all doing. <laughs> oh well. Alright, have a good night everyone. <laughs>